you know, as we look at this industry, it's a multi-billion dollar industry up and down the valley, and it has direct economic impact on every community uh, throughout this region. And so we're really proud to be able to partner with you and to be here uh, as part of this program. Uh, we want this program to be relevant. And so if you've got topics and, and things that you'd like to see us uh, conduct research on, conduct extension programming with, be sure to talk to Mark or Muhammad or Tom and let them know what your needs are. Uh, communicate with them. We really want this to be relevant to you. I also wanna give you just a couple of quick personnel updates. I know many of you are kind of watching uh, NDSU here. We, have, we will have a new president uh, come July 1. And so uh, the search committee for the, the president is working to identify candidates that will come into campus for interviews uh, later this month and early in February. Uh, Dr. Bashani, uh, 12 years of service at the institution, remarkable uh, run that he's had. And we're very grateful for his leadership uh, as part of this institution. And, and certainly from my standpoint, for his appreciation for agriculture and, and the impact that agriculture has on the state of North Dakota and this region. In addition, we are also beginning a search for uh, interim director of uh, program leader for uh, ag and natural resources with an extension. Dr. Charlie Stolt now took the job as director of University of Nebraska's extension programs uh, beginning January 1st. And so we'll look forward to having a, a new director for our ANR programs and extension uh, later this year. Mohammed, with that, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with you this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Mr. Eric Erdman, the chairman of the RD board. Thank you, Mohammed. Good morning. On behalf of the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board of Minnesota and North Dakota, I'd like to welcome you to our 52nd annual Sugar Beet Research Reporting Session. Thank you for taking this opportunity to attend, whether it is here in person or uh, virtually, and to our friends and colleagues attending online from around the world. In Austria, Germany, Serbia, Ukraine, New Zealand, and of course in Canada and here in the US. The sugar beet industry is a very vibrant and economically important in this region where over 55% of the sugar beets are produced and results over $5 billion of total economic activity. Our producers are strong proponents of research, are very progressive and rapid adapters of technology. We are thankful to our producers for their continued funding and to our researchers for consistently providing practical, sustainable, and economical solutions to our problems. Thank you for participating today. And I hope you have a productive and educational meeting. Thank you. So our first speaker will be all the way from Sweden, uh, Dr. Desri. She will discuss focus areas for sustainable intensification of the sugar beet crop in Sweden and Denmark. Uh, Dr. Desri, I don't know how to pronounce her last name well. Managing Director for the Nordic Beet Research, Holby, Denmark. Good morning, everybody. My name is Desiree Börjestotter, and I'm very honored to be invited to the 52nd Annual Sugar Beet Research Reporting Session. Um, I'm the Managing Director, as, you, as uh, Mr. Kahn uh, said, of uh, Nordic Beet Research. Uh, since 2016, when I switched to sugar beet after a broad engagement in the crop production in this region. First, I will briefly introduce the sugar beet production in our part of the world. Then I continue to talk about sustainable intensification and one challenge we struggle with in, the respect, in that respect. Before I sum up with the conclusions, what to do to continue de the development in our crop. So, First, to decrease the distance today, I would like to put you on our map. See if I can do that, yeah. And from this nice overlay of North America to Europe. So here in the very center, you can see Fargo. And if we continue Northwest, like uh, 1,300 kilometers, you finally come to Denmark and Sweden. Uh, my everyday work is far from where you are growing sugar beets. Uh, we will see here today if uh, we, despite the distance, might have something in common. Uh, 
Um, here is a close up of, I'll see if I can. Oh, perfect. Here is a close up of Denmark and Sweden. Uh, in the area, we have around 60,000 hectares, which, which is equivalent to 148,000 acres sugar beet, grown by 1,700 farmers that delivers to three factories. We also grow organic sugar beets to a small extent and mainly to serve industrial customers with locally produced sugar also for this market segment. So NBR, Nordic Beet Research, is a small institute based, based funded by the growers in Denmark and Sweden together with sugar industry in our two countries. About 40% of our funds come from this agreement and the rest from company trials, including variety trials, plus external research funds. We are today 10 colleagues, including two PhD students, and you will soon meet uh, one from my team, Annelise Hansen, who is today talk about weed control in our area. Well, we work mainly in applied research projects with close relation to the challenges sugar beet growers face here. I will come back to that, but firstly, I would like to show yield data from our two countries. Um, here you see the Danish and the Swedish uh, yield development the last decades. And maybe most interesting might be to see the trend uh, that we have an increase of about 200 kilograms sugar per hectare and year, equivalent to 80 kilograms per acre and year. And we say that about half of this increase is related to the genetic material in the varieties. This is actual campaign data, and the sugar beet crop is a good example of how genetic potential is well handled by the farmers. You also see that the levels differ between our two countries. And for that reason, today I will focus on Sweden. Now to sustainable intensification and wise people, researchers have stated that food is the key to the global goals for the future. Our defin one definition of sustainable intensification is to increase yields without adverse environmental impact and without the cultivation of more land. It is not an easy task um, and in combination with the strategy for Europe, the European Green Deal, we are certainly challenged. To put it in our context, we see both challenges and possibilities. Looking back, uh, the sugar yields, I said, increased with about 80 kilograms per acre in the year. And this is by increase of root yield. Since sugar content is actually very stable in our area over the last 35 years. Here we might have genetic potential for the breeders to develop and for, to further develop. Um, with, mon with more focus on sustainability, sugar content is interesting to increase the importance of in the price negotiations, I think. You get what you pay for. Um, so we have a large engagement from the plant breeding companies in our region. And I said half of the uh, yield development comes from the varieties. And they test every year 80 varieties in our two countries. And on the recommended list, we have about 25 varieties. The growing season is prolonged. And looking 60 years back, we now have an average 11 days longer growing season um, in the area due to, well, the climatic change. The management of the crop is improved small steps at a time. 
and we have identified areas of certain concern and included them in our NBR strategy over time for future development. And I have chosen fertility and plant nutrition establishment with an insect control you will hear more about from Annelise Hansen in a minute and control of leaf diseases, harvest and storage as certain focus areas. At la and last, but absolutely not least, the growers that are devoted and engaged in the crop to invest and apply knowledge is a success factor. We have a lot to talk about, as you see. However, I need to restrict myself uh, to only talk about one of our challenges today. And um, well, I chose to start with the basics. And here is actually a typical sugar beet field outside my window at this time of year. Uh, a fertile soil with excellent status waiting for the sugar beet to be established in end of March, beginning of April. Or at the end of June, it looked like this. We saw this in, in large scale five years ago when many hectares of the very best areas in Sweden looked like this. We started case studies to follow up the soil status, soil structure, we analyzed for nematodes, aphanomyces, and everything we could think about. The season of 2017 was wet, and then it was followed by 2018, that was really dry, and the problem occurred even one more month earlier. We continued also the following year, and looking back, it is almost embarrassing that we couldn't conclude that it all was about soil fertility from day one. In all fields being sampled, we found uh, low pH and low calcium availability, sometimes in combination with aphanomyces. We had low uh, phosphorus and potassium status, less uh, ro less common to apply the fertilizers row applicate with row application so a lower conductivity closer to the plants and not always was sodium applied in these fields and for different reasons we are facing this at significant more locations compared 20 years ago so it's a little new problem if I had more time, I could have showed you data and also had discuss, discussion with you to hear about your experience in this field, but maybe next time. Well, I see one large reason to be cost savings supported by the environmental regulations to prevent further eutrophication of the Baltic Sea. Also, the long-term financing of land is part of it, with about 40% of the land rented in the sugar beet region nowadays, and thereby less interest to invest long-term for the growers. However, yield potential is strongly negatively affected, and so is profitability of cultivation of sugar beets, but also canola, and in worst cases also in cereals when it looks like this. So under unfavorable conditions, uh, the availability of nutrient is limiting growth together with less conductivity in the soil favors this, the aphanomyces, and this gives less growth rate to the sugar beets. And it all sends in low yield potential. Soil fertility was studied since 1957, that is for 64 years, in four long-term fertility trials with sugar beets in the rotation every fourth year at the university. And we've, well, eventually we found out about it and, the trial, and these trials and asked for data. And as you know, phosphorus is a complex subject and the plant needs in comparison rather small amounts 
at the same time as the soil often holds sufficient uh, amounts. It is uh, all about availability, which varies a lot between soil types, but also um, depends on water supply. In the plant, uh, the phosphorus is, a is as necessary as nitrogen to reach high yield levels. And typically the sugar beet takes away 20 to 30 kilograms of phosphorus and the soil in the road zone, zone contains often many thousand kilos. However, the system is uh, not easy to affect and the movement extremely slow. The results of these trials shows uh, if we set removal of phosphor and potassium as a standard, um, so 64 years, without applying any phosphorus and potassium in the rotation, we have actually uh, an impact on the sugar yield with 36% lower yield. And if we apply removal plus 15 kilograms uh, of phosphorus and 40 kilograms of potassium, and now I have to say this is per hectare, so divide it by two and a half to get it on acres uh, for you. Uh, we have an impact of seven, and if we apply the double plus removal, we have a positive result of 20% higher yield. So this well pays for the costs of the applications. So to conclude and emphasize the most important limiting factors we see uh, in soil fertility to reach the potential yields all, in all fields and in all parts of the fields is row application of a full uh, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium plus micronutrients fertilizer at sowing. And here you see, um, well, it's, sorry, it's hitting behind here. You see that here is the, the row and you can see the, the sugar beet seed here. And here we have the, the row application of fertilizer. So this is our recommendation to put it, well, we sow at two centimeters and then six centimeters below the seed and six centimeters beside the row we apply the nutrients. Maybe it's the same way you do it. Um, we also aim for a high availability of phosphorus. And we, this means to have a positive balance over the crop rotation. Um, and this is in all parts of the field. So one method is to use variable application rates, both for phosphorus phosphorus and potassium and precision farmers, farming and variable rate applications for lime and also uh, phosphorus and potassium to lower the field. The infield variation is used on about 20% of the sugar beet fields. And here we have room for improvements. But here is a typical example from 2009 and uh, we have applied, this is for phosphorus, and it was applied over 10 years. And you can see that the, the maps are improving. Well, um, it's important when you grow sugar beets uh, to have a pH at 7, 7.5. And then when you have reached that level, continue to um, apply lime once in the rotation, that is our recommendation. We need to keep balance of potassium, but also apply nitro, uh, sodium, sorry. And um, that can, we can see in some, in some field that the higher conductivity, we can have less aphonomyces. But this is an area where we do some projects and some research around. Yeah. Well, we did not talk about um, infiltration and drainage, which is also very important for the soil fertility. Most fields are drained in our region and in relation to land prices, it is uh, highest priority to keep them in best standards. 
And here is uh, how it can look like in our countries. But to be able to reach the goals of the future, feeding the world, we all need to manage the land resources at our best and use the best practice. And in this context, soil fertility and sustainable intensification plays the major role. So I say thank you very much. Our next speaker will also be from Denmark, Dr. Annie Lisbeth Hansen. She will speak on managing weeds in sugar beet in Denmark, Sweden, and EU, successes and challenges. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I will give an introduction to managing weeds in sugar beets in Denmark and Sweden with an outlook to European Union and look into our successes and challenges. At our European uh, latitudes, control of uh, weed is one of the most important factors to ensure a high sugar yield. That is because weeds compete strongly with light nutrients and water with the crop. Danish trials show already a 2% weed cover in June, a risk of 3% yield loss as seen in the figure. Besides the direct loss of sugar yield, poor weed control will hamper the harvest, increase the tear, increase infestation of pests and diseases, and moreover, it will increase the seed bank in the soil and escalate weed problems throughout the whole crop rotation. To a large extent, our weed control is determined or regulated politically. Some points here to mention are back in the 18th and 19th, most, much research and trial work were performed with a successful development of low dose strategies where optimal timing is combined with the lowest possible dose of herbicides while maintaining a high efficacy. Especially in Denmark and Sweden, there has been extra focus on reducing the pesticide use and the amount of pesticide used has been halved from the 18th to year 2000. Approval of plant protection products is regulated in EU. The approval is very strict compared to, for example, the American system which means that we have much less available pesticides for outdoor use. The given approvals are valid for a limited period and then they must go into a renewal process where new criteria might have been put up. Following the EU approval, the substance can be undertaken national approval regarding focus areas. In Denmark, occurrence of metabolites in the groundwater is an issue, and in Sweden, the surface water is taking more into considerations. And uh, since 2014, all professional users must implement integrated pest management and the eight uh, principles. Uh, for example, um, uh, look into crop rotation, monitoring, and decision support systems. To increase a sustainable use of pesticides in agriculture in EU, EU has set up uh, a set of goals for the next 10 years, which among others is to reduce by 50% the use and risk of chemical pesticides by 2030. And to compare a baseline from that on average of the years 15, 16 and 17. Also to mention here is that the European Union will boost environmentally friendly practices among others by aiming for 25% of total farmland under organic farming by 2030. In our region, most conventional weed control strategies consist of one pre-emergence application as an option and three to four post-emergence treatments beginning at the first flush of the weeds at cotyledon stage. Uh, 
The cornerstone active ingredients are fenmeter fem, etofumacet, and mesometron, and depending on the wheat species, for example, also trifosulforone and clomazone is added. Some sugar beet growers will perform a mechanical cleaning after end of the herbicide program before row closure or perhaps even before the last spray. In some countries, the Conviso Smart system is available where an ALS tolerant variety is grown and two applications of the ALS herbicide Conviso 1 plus a conventional herbicide is applied. And more about the active substances that we are using for the control of dicot weeds. Here we see an overview of the estimated percentage share of treated area with active substances for Sweden, Denmark, Germany, France, and Netherlands, where we see that often the often most often used herbicides in the dark green and in the lighter green colors the herbicides to be added. However, the substances in the lighter colors must not be considered to be of less importance as they control specific weed species, which is else not controllable. In the bottom of the table, the estimated use of mechanical weed is noted, and probably Denmark, Sweden and France are in the front using most hoeing in these years. From this list, we have lately lost substances, for some desmidifam, which was not reauthorized. Here in yellow, you see the ingredients which are either under renewal or which are soon entering the renewal process. And as you can see, there is quite a lot. We support the work in our RLB weed control group in order to support the renewal process. For example, uh, are we at the moment uh, supporting the renewal process of trifosilforone? Resistance. Another important challenge is the increased development of herbicide resistant weed species. The graph shows the increase of resistant, resistance to five herbicides uh, mode of actions. Different herbicide mode of actions have different tendencies to select for resistance, and this we must be aware of and seek to prevent. ALS inhibitor herbicides group 2 are the most prone to develop resistance and dominates among our weed species, especially in the grasses, and in the same time ALS inhibitor herbicides are frequently used used in the whole crop rotation. It is a challenge to avoid building up resistance in weed and demands a good management. Moreover, the likelihood of having less available active ingredients in the future make prevention even more difficult. In NBR, uh, we perform Uh, we control trials each year. As an example here, we are studying, uh, what we are studying, I show an average of two Danish trials from last year. The orange bars show percentage efficacy. The basic treatment is seen in the table below for uh, replications, which consist of in total six liter bitternal containing fenmetifam, half a liter nortron containing etofumacet, three liter gold text containing metamitron, 10 grams of farin containing trifosulforone and half a liter of oil per treatment. In the cold control treatment, there was an average 46% weed cover observed in June, and the dominating species were fat hen, foods parsley and cleavers. In the control, yeah, we can see that, um, we lose. Um, here in the red ring, we can see that um, we lose efficacy when we are leaving out desmetifam as in entry from entry 2 to entry 3. 
Uh, and uh, the problem is that Desmodi frame was uh, banned at the renewal process, and we have left uh, left. We have uh, it. Uh, Desmodi frame was banned, but we have left uh, to use Fenmedi frame. Adding chromosome helps, however, on the efficacy. We lose, if we risk to lose fin Medifam, which is also at the renewal process, but it is foreseen that there will be no problem. But if we lose fin Medifam, we will have quite a lower efficacy as we see here. Uh, adding chromosome and more Safari and also Metrigone will uh, help on the efficacy. <clears throat> As an overall, we can see that uh, we are in the field where we are dealing with a delicate balance and timing is very important. Studying uh, the combination of mechanical and chemical weed control. Here I want to show results from a Swedish set of trials where it was studied how much herbicides we can save when we perform three row cleanings. A 12 row machine with GPS RTK guidance on both the tractor and the row cleaner was used. Distance to the bead plants were adjusted as seen on the small pictures below, where the distances started are 4, 8, and 12 centimeters. Healing was started with the aim of cover the weed, soil was moved into the row and the bead plants were covered up to 70%. In this study, number of weed are counted in the row and not between the rows, because between the rows, the weeds are controlled in an efficient way. But the question is how we fight the weed in the row. In the figure to the right, one dose of herbicide is applied at first weed flush T1 followed by three mechanical row cleanings. We have 10 to 20 weeds per square meter in the row. This is not good enough, but we can also see that the picture is getting better the closer to the row we get. And even better if we move some soil into the row by healing. In the middle picture, we have applied two half doses of herbicides and it is getting better with uh, less lead, the weed left, with less weed left. Uh, however, it is not uh, quite good enough yet. In the figure to the right, combining two herbicide treatments at T1 and T2 with mechanical cleaning, we are down to an acceptable level of weeds left. Healing gives 30 to 40% less weed in the row. Other trials have shown similar results. Mechanical weeding is most successful when small weeds up to four leaves are treated twice and, and uh, is treated twice or more and in, in dry, uh, under dry conditions. Measuring sugar yield in such trials show that the closer, the later, and the more often mechanical cleaning are performed, the more sugar yield is lost due to the treatment, uh, but it is around <clears throat> one to 3%. And in the present, presence of weed, the weeds are more expensive. Coming to the future weed control, uh, will to a higher extent be based on integrated solutions and many promising development, developments are ongoing. Overall, on our um, latitude, it is likely that we will continue to see a reduction in the approved active substances and also in the allowed doses. Machinery for mechanical weeding exists today with more robust constructions which perform with higher precision, steered by cameras or GPS RTK. The Convention Smart System, developed by KWS and Bayer, variety is now also sold by Sisvanderhave, Beta Seed, and DLF Beat Seed. 
is a system available in some European countries. Conviso 1 was launched in 2016 in Sweden and Lithuania and in Finland in 2017 with a dose of one liter in a single or split treatment. There is an advantage using the system where the weed pressure is very high or where there's many weed beads. The system is used in some countries, for example, Lithuania, where, is, where it is used in about 50% or ab above 50% of the area and, in, and above 30% of the area uh, in, for example, Finland and Spain and in Sweden, approximately used uh, at 10% of the area. Coming to precision farming, uh, we go from broadcast to smart spraying using camera, GPS guidance, machine learning algorithm, and weed recognition provide new opportunities for reducing the use of pesticides. In Denmark, we are working with new spray equipment and band spraying. Also, we are working with, for example, spot, spot spraying. So, so spraying just around the beet plant as seen on the photo um, to the right on the UV light. The robots are coming, or they are already here. We are working with two Danish types, Agro Intelli Roboti, which is an uh, autonomously robot controlled with a computer, which can carry various equipment with a three-point hitch. Also the farm droid, a fully automatic robot driven by a solar panel, performing sewing with GPS positioning of the seeds, and which perform weed cleaning. Also, there exist uh, other types of, of robots in, in Europe. Um, yeah, um, with that, I will end my presentation. And uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Annie, when do you estimate there will be widespread use of robots in Europe for weed control? Uh, there's already some uh, robots have been sold. Uh, uh, and uh, <laughs> I cannot say when, when it will be, uh, be, uh, be used uh, for, in a large uh, scale, but it is, uh, it is in a uh, quick development and there are already a uh, hundred or more sold and is uh, running and um, there are quite a good satisfactory um, experience with, with that or Thank with you. these. Other questions, can you please put it in the chat box? So it seems like the future in Europe, there will be reducing pesticide by 50%. Some of it will be organic. You'll probably have to use robot to manage weeds successfully uh, for sustainable sugar beet production. Mark, you want to get ready for the next speaker, please? Uh, this will be Dr. Debbie Sparks from the University of Nottingham. She will discuss the impact of canopy architecture on radiation use efficiency of sugar beet. Thank you, Mohammed, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak at your, your meeting today. Uh, much appreciated. Um, so in my um, presentation, I'm going to discuss our ongoing work on canopy architecture and sugar beet. Uh, and I should start by acknowledging from the beginning that uh, Lucy Tillier, the, the PhD student, has done all the, all the hard work on this project. And when I say we, I usually mean Lucy. So I should, should say that from the start. So there's no, no misconceptions. So the project really started um, with um, thinking about the different canopy architectures that um, we've seen coming through in, our, in new varieties in recent years. The relationship between intercepted radiation and sugar yield is long uh, established in, in the, in the um, absence of other limitations. And while there's now some discussion of re-sync limitation uh, in sugar beet, at least in the UK, we still find that this direct linear relationship um, holds true. So we were really interested in these different prostrate and more upright canopy architectures that have um, we've seen in, in recent years. Uh, I can just try to get a 
pointer. So you can see in this photograph here, we've got one variety that's much more upright and one that's much more prostrate. And we set out to ask, how does canopy architecture impact light interception by the crop, uh, radiation use efficiency, and of course, yield. As I said, this work is part of a PhD project, and some of you may have already met Lucy Tillier at, uh, at events such as the IRB Congress. Um, so she's doing the, the, the hard work, as I said. Um, in terms of monitoring our canopy um, response over time and canopy, um, canopy closure and light interception, we're unable to use uh, drones at our, um, our site in Nottinghamshire because we're directly under the flight path for East Midlands Airport. So we had to be creative and mount some sensors on the, on the tractor here. So we've got a downward facing camera and also a downward facing sensor monitoring things such as NDVI and NDRE. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see a photograph. So um, once we take the photograph, we then um, use image analysis software uh, and here the, the green of the canopy has been um, marked as red and then we count the pixels to work out percentage canopy cover. And then that data is plotted on the, the chart on the right and you can see here we're looking at four different or three different canopy architectures. So uh, a prostrate, a very flat canopy, a more upright canopy and two uh, varieties that had a more intermediate canopy. Um, and in this, this first year, this is 2019, uh, you can see that um, during the period from about 70 to 120 days after sowing, um, the varieties were quite different in terms of their canopy cover and therefore their light interception and converting that light in, into sugar, um, with the two intermediate varieties intercepting uh, more radiation than the um, prostrate and the upright varieties. Of course, we wanted to understand um, you know, the reasons behind that. And one of the um, measurements that Lucy developed was um, working out the canopy angle or the PTL angle. So by carefully taking photographs in the field and working out um, the angle between the, the most upright and the, the insertion of the PTLs, we calculated the, the canopy angle. And what you can see here is that the prostrate, uh, because there's a, a larger canopy angle from the upright to the insertion of the leaf, has the, um, has the highest um, angle. And then we've got the upright at the bottom and the intermediate in the two. So clearly there are big differences in the architecture of the canopy. And this is likely to explain some of the differences in canopy cover and therefore uh, light interception prior to canopy closure. But we were more interested in radiation use efficiency and, and therefore yield um, than canopy cover in its own right. So in order to calculate radiation use efficiency, we, we did that the old fashioned way really by sequential harvests um, over time to measure biomass and then um, calculate radiation use efficiency. So you can see the photograph of some of this, this hard work in the field and here on the right, I've plotted um, total biomass over time for the four different varieties. And again, we can see that as time goes on and as we get to the, towards the end of the season, the two intermediate varieties sort of pull away in terms of their, their total biomass in, in tons per hectare. We then took this data along with the canopy cover data and the local uh, Met Office data for light uh, incident radiation. And we use that to calculate radiation use efficiency. And that's shown on the, the chart on the left. Um, and we can see that the, so what we've got here color coded, the, the intermediate varieties prostrate and upright with the, the dots color coded on the chart. And the figure you've got here, 1.82, that tells you that for every um, one gram or, or one megajoule of light intercepted is producing uh, 1.82 grams of biomass. So 1.82, grams of biomass per megajoule of radiation intercepted. And what the stats showed us was that the two intermediate varieties had a higher radiation use efficiency than the prostrate and the uh, prostrate and the upright. They were they were quite they were similar to each other but lower than the two intermediate ones. And that came through in yield very clearly. So you can see again that the two intermediate varieties had a higher yield, um, much higher sugar yield than both the upright and the prostrate. And 
Surprisingly to us, there was no real difference between the upright and the prostrate um, architectures. So we, we clearly were picking up some differences, but were these differences due to canopy architecture or to some other genetic differences between the varieties that we had selected? We don't, you know, we'd only got four varieties here. Um, one example of a prostrate, one example of an upright and two intermediate. So we couldn't be sure that it was about canopy architecture. There could have been some other, other differences. So moving on into the second year of the study, Unfortunately, this coincided with the, the this beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, which meant there were no field experiments for us in 2020. But later that year, as the restrictions eased a bit, we were able to um, conduct a controlled environment study, uh, which looked at the photosynthetic capacity of the different varieties. Um, this time, we, because of space constraints, we only used one of the intermediate varieties, but we had the prostrate and the um, upright um, varieties in there. And there was what we've got on the chart is the, the three varieties and then leaf four and leaf seven. So leaf seven is the youngest leaf. So leaf four emerged before leaf seven. And actually statistically, there was no interaction between a variety and leaf number. So I've just included the chart for completeness. Um, and then the tables on the right here show us that where we've actually got significant differences. So this Amax value is the maximum um, photosynthetic rate that we measured of, of these different uh, leaves and different varieties. And you can clearly see here that the youngest leaf had a higher photosynthetic capacity um, than the older leaf, which is as we would expect. And we can also see on the table above that the intermediate variety had a higher photosynthetic capacity um, or photosynthetic rate than the prostrate and the upright varieties. And, Although there's a numeric difference between those two, it wasn't a significant difference. Um, we measured lots of um, aspects of the of photosynthesis uh, and just want to present two more. One is the light saturation point. So this is the point at which um, there was no further response to, to light that, that, and the light was, you know, the canopy was saturated by light. And again, I've done the same thing and showed you the, the, the table, the chart for completeness and then the tables uh, for the stats purposes. So again, we can see that the younger leaf has a higher light saturation point than the older leaf, and the intermediate variety had a higher light saturation point than the prostrate and the upright. Um, so what that means is, you know, in the field, we would expect the intermediate variety to keep photosynthesizing at higher light levels. Uh, I should just say that the absolute levels that you're seeing here are not that high, and that's because the, the CE or the control environment room cannot produce very, very high light levels. Um, but in terms of the acclimation of these varieties, we, we're seeing the, the, the relative differences between the, the different canopy uh, architectures. And then the final thing um, with regard to the photosynthetic capacity is something called the quantum yield. And this is a, a measure of photosynthetic efficiency. So it's a, a dimensionless um, a characteristic, but it's taken to reflect photosynthetic efficiency. There are no differences between the, the leaf age at this, at this uh, measurement, but again, you can see the intermediate variety has having a much higher photosynthetic efficiency than the um, prostrate and the upright. So, the controlled environment data seems to fit very well with the field data in that the inter intermediate variety has a higher Amax, a higher quantum yield and a higher light saturation point. But we still don't know if this relates to canopy architecture. So this year we set out to, to sort of test this more in the field. The field study was expanded to include more varieties. So we had, uh, I think, six varieties in total and then also some direct sort of manipulations of the canopy. And we, we did this in two ways. The first way on, on the left-hand side, I don't know how well you can see this photograph, but we've actually planted alternate rows, one of a more prostrate and one of a more upright um, variety in order to create a, a sort of mixed canopy that we hoped would be more efficient than growing either the prostrate or the upright on their own. And then on the right-hand side, um, we took the same genetic background, so one variety, one of the intermediate varieties, and we artificially manipulated the canopy angle. And that was done very meticulously by Lucy, who went out and used some, some sort of pegs, like tent pegs, to hold down the leaves so that to create a more prostrate uh, canopy, and also used what we called these sort of cages 
uh, to push the canopy uh, more upright. And then um, over the year, uh, Lucy's measured lots of um, very detailed uh, assessments of, of light interception, light capture and photosynthesis on these, on these varieties uh, and, and these treatments. In addition to measuring things like canopy cover, NDVI and NDRE from the tractor as we did two years ago, um, we also added an extra sensor so that we could measure reflectance from the canopy because we hadn't really considered that before. We'd sort of assumed that all the canopy architectures would reflect the same amount of light, but we're now looking in detail at whether some uh, canopies absorb more than others and some reflect more than others. So that's being uh, studied as we speak. And then uh, Lucy also used the uh, what's called the ASD field spec to take uh, a wide range of spectral indices over the season. So we combined um, measurements at the canopy level with measurements at the leaf level. Um, what I'll say at this stage is that the, the, the results look really interesting and consistent with our previous findings, but Lucy will be presenting these in, in detail at the IRB Congress in June. So I don't want to, to steal her thunder here and I would just say, uh, watch this space. I would just like to finish with this image created by, by Annie, who's another member of our, our BEAT team at the University of Nottingham. She made this for the, for the Christmas card um, after doing some very cold um, measurements uh, in December this year, just before harvest, although not as cold as, as North Dakota, of course, but, but pretty chilly for us here in the UK. And with that, I'll, I'll finish my talk and I'm very happy to answer any questions. Our next speaker will be Dr. Bram Hansey from the IRS in Netherlands. And he will share with us Stemphilium beticula, the cause of yellow leaf spot in sugar beet. And this is more or less to make our producers in the US aware of a potential disease. It has been found in the US on spinach and table beets. So all our producers look at this. If you see any symptoms like this, report it to your agriculturists. And then we at the university and research centers uh, will become aware of this as well. I'm very pleased to present something about uh, Stemphilium beticola, which is a kind of, um, well, a new disease in the Netherlands, um, which although started his career at the same time as it, I did start my career as a phytopathologist um, in Superbeet. So we grow up together. Um, a picture of the Netherlands. Um, we're quite close to uh, Germany and uh, the UK. Um, a large part of our acreage is below the sea level uh, and we grow um, 48,000 hectares, so about 200,000 acres of sugar beets. That's more than tulips we grow. Um, we still have those nice pictures of tulips and windmills, but I prefer the sugar beet and uh, a windmill. Uh, our sugar yield is about 30.7 tons a hectare this year. Uh, we have two factories, one in the south, where also our institute is located, and one in the north, um, uh, where we process uh, all the sugar beets in about 120 days at each factory. For the folio diseases in the Netherlands, we grow sugar beets for about 80 years, and we have a, well, a long history with folio diseases, especially powdery mildew and the rust. And malaria, which, which are quite mild under our conditions. Um, in the eight, 1980s of last century, we um, get some experience with the Cospra. Um, it moved from Italy and Greece via France and Germany to the Netherlands, and it caused up to 40% of sugar yield reduction. And that's quite a lot. So the main focus was in the past on the Cospra management. In 2007, we found some fields which were applied with uh, fungicides, uh, mostly products Allegro and Obestine, which contain epoxyconazole. And it turned already in September quite brown and yellow. And we visited those fields because the farmers were complaining they could not get uh, manage their Cicospora infestation or their Ramalaria infestation. Um, when we entered those fields, the first glance was quite yellowish on those uh, leaves, which is not typical for Secospa or Ramalaria. Um, we ex uh, examined the spots on, the, uh, on those leaves and uh, got to the conclusion that it's nor 
Så jeg kan også spørge, når rammer det her? It's some other disease, but we did not know which one. Uh, so this first fields, which were quite located in the northeast, um, were well, the first we have uh, large infestations and yield loss due to this fungus. Those spots, um, we call them initially yellow spot disease, uh, are quite typically uh, irregular and yellow. And when you have some backlight from the leaves, they are quite shiny. So it could also be a virus. So we checked for viruses, we checked for nutrient uh, deficiency, uh, we checked for bacteria, and we checked for uh, fungus. And uh, we isolated quite a lot of fungi from those uh, diseased leaves. But the tiny yellow spots necrotize from inside out, grow in size, and when you have a lot of spots, they uh, come together and your canopy turns brown and is not very efficient in uh, picking up the sunlight and transform it into sugar. Typically, those spots are irregular. So the size, it's, it's, when it's round, it's not stemphilium. You can say it by heart. It's irregular in size and in the middle or somewhere in the middle of the yellow spot, you have a necrotizing tissue. It turns later on a brownish spot, which can be nicely rounded, but also quite irregular in shape. And often you see those yellow spots and dots uh, next to those brown uh, necrotized tissue. Um, very typically, irregular in size, the yellow spot, and then the brown dot in the middle, the necrotizing tissue. So it can, it's the growing fungal tissue in the leaf tissue, and you uh, have some interaction with some toxins from the stemphilium, which is causing the yellowing uh, in the leaves. Uh, very nice symptoms uh, for a phytopathologist, for a farmer when it goes quite quick from uh, infection to uh, to spots, it, it's about one week, so you can have multiple uh, uh, generations of those uh, fungal infestation in your field uh, in a season, and that's causing, uh, without any management, the total collapse of your canopy. And later in the season, so about late August, early September, you can see both the yellow spots and the brown tissue. Uh, initially, it starts with a few uh, yellow spots on those leaves, hard to find, and it's easy to mix up. It looks like insect damage when you have those nice round yellow appearance on the other side of the leaf. When you turn the leaf upside down, you see that some insect has eaten away some of the leaf tissue, causing a yellow glance on the other side of the leaf. Also, some insect stings, which puncture the leaf, suck out some, uh, some tissue. The sugar beet reacts with a yellow uh, surrounding of those stings. The older spots look quite like Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas, the bacterial leaf spot, uh, also causes those brown spots, which has uh, 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 quite a weak uh, brown tissue, and um, you have those scar, uh, the, those brackets of the, the leaves quite easily. It's also with the brown spots of Stemphilia. Um Burned in spray liquid. Um, you often see it with herbicide foliar mixes. Uh, when they are applied under full sunlight, you have some droplets which burn in to the uh, to the leaf tissue and leaving some scars. It also quite looks like those stephylium yellow spots, uh, but are not so. There can be some misdiagnosis uh, for the uh, stemphilium. Also manganese deficiency. Uh, when you turn the leaves up to the sunlight, you have those yellow spots, the yellow uh, clouds in the leaves. Uh, even when it's a quite Old manganese deficiency, you can have also brown uh, dots inside those scars, uh, which can be uh, misunderstood for stemphilium. So be aware when you're scouting in your field, not all yellow spots are stemphilium spots. Um, we isolated stemphilium from those yellow leaf spots, and um, when we grow them on 
nutrient media in the lab. We saw those nice stenphidium uh, spores and, well, try to identify, identify those uh, the, the stenphidium species on that. And that took multiple years before we got to the conclusion um, it's a new species. Um, we have to give it a name. So we named it after sugar beet. Um, but also this identification, we did it together with the Westerdijk Institute in Utrecht, uh, the Netherlands. Um, this identification caused a complete revision of the genus Stenphilium. Um, but in the collection of this Westerdijk Institute, also some old strains of Stenphilium, which were not identified before, but collected in the uh, 70s and 80s of last century, um, or originate from Canada and the US. So, uh, Stenphilium beta cola is already present over there since a long time, and when it's, once it acquires enough, uh, uh, when you have enough spores on a hectare, you will see the spots anyway. In our field trials, it uh, can cause up to 40% lower sugar yield. So uh, under favorable conditions in the Netherlands, it is as aggressive as Secospora beta cola. So that means we have a lot of effort to reduce the impact of this fungus on our sugar yield. First thing, we were asked to, um, uh, to investigate was, is there a relation with those varieties where we find a lot of uh, stenphilia on it? Is it variety dependent? So we can, can skip out those most susceptible varieties and then go on like we uh, were used to. So I had some isolates um, from all over the country. Um, and you see that there is a, uh, a difference in ranking per isolate. So isolate one and isolate two are quite close together, uh, isolated in the northeast of, uh, uh, in the northwest of the country. Uh, and isolate three was uh, isolated uh, in the uh, northeast of the country. And you see, we have on top, so least susceptible isolate one and isolate two, the variety Rhino, which was blamed in the northeast for the most susceptible. And also for in the, uh, uh, the, the variety Isabella KWS, which is um, uh, the variety where we isolated isolate free from. Uh, there it's the most aggressive and on isolate one, uh, uh, Isabella KWS is, well, really uh, unsusceptible. Um, also for the rhino, you see some differences. So that means when well, we have a small country, <laughs> but when we have uh, this uh, distinct locations and distinct uh, isolates, uh, we get a distinct ranking of the varieties. So that's quite problematic when you would like to give one advice to growers. So we um, treated Philium like uh, our Secospora. We did a lot of research for uh, fungicide efficacy um, and we put it in our monitor based system. So we start monitoring for foliar diseases after canopy closure at least once a week. That's our advice. Um, but well, the best practice is to do it once a week. Um, some farmers skip it and do it once a month. Uh, and then, well, they are most prone to make mistakes in the uh, management of foliar diseases. When we uh, find some uh, spots, fungal spots, either Secospa, either Rust or Stenphilium. Uh, we have a fungicide application and then we start monitoring two or three weeks after the application of those uh, uh, of the fungicides. Um, and then we have a new application when we see an increase of infestation or a new foliar disease. Uh, that means that we have one system for all foliar diseases. And then we need to know what uh, the product you should use uh, for the uh, management of Stenphilium beta cola. We have some products like Opestim, which is uh, a product based on epoxyconazole, which is quite eff uh, effective against the Cospa beta cola, but it's ineffective against Stenphilium beta cola. 
Uh, the same for the Allegro, it's trisoxin, methyl, and epoxy -conazole. It's I use it in my field trials as a control to have uh, to, to have no influence of cyclospora in those plots. But it's, um, for Stamphidium, it's, it's like you apply water. Then we have the ciproconazole, the difficonazole, it's one plus. Sometimes when you have fempropidin next to the uh, difficonazole, you can have the second plus. Um, and then we have the three pluses uh, for the buscalite, so the SDHI fungicides, um, the same for the propyls, the fluopiram. So those SDHIs are much more effective than the triazoles and the strobilorins. Are we unique? No. Uh, since 2007, um, the first years we thought we were unique having this disease. But since that time, I presented a few times at the IRB or other contests uh, on this uh, uh, fungal disease in Sukkobit. Uh, and then I received some photos or even leaves from other countries showing the typical symptoms uh, of Stamphidium beticola also in other countries. So the photos, uh, the acknowledgement is in the photo itself. So we see almost the whole northwest, north, north part, northern part of Europe, we can find uh, the Stamphidium beticola. And at the end, this is our goal, keeping healthy leaves up to the harvest. Um, are there any questions? Like, One question yeah. for you, Bram. Do you think the pathogen will survive under US conditions? Um, well, <laughs> the pathogen won't survive when it's dry. Uh, it needs a lot of humidity to infect the sugar beet leaves. Um, up to eight hours of leaf uh, wetness. So we see the years where it's, which are typical Dutch summers. So we have a lot of rainfall, lower temperatures, so around 25 degrees. Uh, we see a lot of stamphilium. When we have high temperatures, so about 30, 35 degrees Celsius, and um, a, a quick drying up of the canopy, it favors Cicospora beticola. So in years, we have a lot of Cicospora beticola, so our, our warm and dry and hot summers. The years where we have some Fium beticola are uh, wet and cool. Uh, for the winter, uh, it can survive on the, uh, the, the host tissue. Um, there are more hosts like potato, but also some green manure crops. Uh, and we are able to uh, freeze it, uh, the spores, uh, up to minus 80. So we can store those isolates at minus 80. So when, when winter is coming quite easy, uh, quite slowly, so uh, there is not a quick uh, drop of temperature, uh, it can even survive those hard winters. And yes. just for your sake, yes, it does survive in, uh, it's present in the US, in Washington state. It was found on table beets and spinach and in uh, New York, they have found it on table beets and on it's very big on onions. All right, our next speaker will be Dr. Raj Majumdar. He will speak on cell, cell wall degrading enzymes originating from Rhizoctonia solani, increased sugar beet fruit damage in the presence of Leuconostoc mesenteroides. Uh, he is with a group from uh, Kimberley that include Dr. Strasbaugh, Dr. Goli Weski, Rakesh, and Rogers. Dr. Raj Kumar. Thank you for the invitation and good morning, everybody. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. So as you see, the title of my talk today is Cell Wall Degrading Enzymes Originating from Rhizoctonia solani Increased Sugar Beet Damage in the Presence of Leuconostoc Mesenteritis. As we all know that uh, Rhizoctonia is one of the major causes of yield and sugar loss in sugar beets and sometimes an interfield can be wiped away by this pathogen depending upon the nature of the infection. Whereas uh, leuconostoc, it's a free living gram positive soil bacterium, which has lesser effect on the root rot when it is present alone. But I think the devastation comes when rhizoctonia and leuconostoc, they are present together in the soil. That causes the most damage and it, you can clearly see here on the screen. So, the most important thing now is that the genetic resistance against uh, R-Solani is highly limited. And 
it will require identification of novel targets or mitigation strategies in the future. So as we know that uh, leuconostoc mesenteroides, they do not produce plant cell wall degrading enzymes. So we hypothesize that this increased damage caused by the close association between these two pathogens is caused by the plant cell wall degrading enzymes that is coming from R. solani. So the experimental approach was uh, pretty straightforward. We had uh, in plant uh, sugar beet root inoculation. So what we do is that we take a cork borer, we add a specific amount of the fungal or uh, bacterium inoculum depending upon the treatments. And then we are also using pure exogenous plant cell wall degrading enzymes. So we collected samples, root samples, two different time points, early time points where one day post inoculation, two day and three day. And then these time points were used to for RNA-seq and metabolites. And then the late time point we use for disease evaluation. So the first objective was to evaluate the disease and how different exogenous enzymes that we had applied, how does it cause the uh, extent of the disease in sugar beet roots. And then objective two was the mRNA sequencing where we are looking at the global gene expression in all three organisms at the early stages of infection. So the goal was to identify the early factors that actually cause this uh, disease symptoms. And we were also interested in looking at the cell wall metabolites because that is one of our major targets. So how does it affect the cell wall degradation? And all of this thing led us to the identification of potential targets for future mitigation strategies. So this slide here shows you uh, the effect of different exogenous uh, enzymes. So the first one is control and you can clearly see that when rhizoctonia is applied separately versus when leuconostoc is applied separately, the infection is quite higher with rhizoctonia alone. But when you put them together, you can clearly see that the damage is quite more. And then the lower panel here, you see three different enzymes that we had used. This is one of them is the pectin lyase and polygalactouranase and the vicozyme. So vicozyme is a combination of all different kinds of plant cell wall degrading enzymes. And you can clearly see that PNL and PG, they had the most impact on the cell wall degradation and more rot in the roots, suggesting that possibly these are the two enzymes contributed by Rhizoctonia solanae is causing the damage when it is in close association with leuconostox. And then we were also interested in looking at the gene expression of the Rhizoctonia solanae at early stages of pathogenesis. And you can clearly see, so each of these, uh, gene family that I'm showing here, pectin lyase and polygalactouranase, they, these are big gene families. They have almost like eight to nine um, members. And we have been able to identify that which paralogs are the critical players that actually contribute to this uh, increased rot. And these are actually uh, boxed in red here. You can see that you can see quite a high expression starting from day one and then the expression increases and then the highest expression that we found was with polygalactouranase, especially with this paralog that had the highest expression. We also see expression of the cellulose genes, but I think the PG and PNL genes were, uh, they had the highest expression in terms of uh, potential factors that cause uh, root rot. But you can see at the day three that more numbers of cellulose genes are being turned on. So now we were very interested to see that, you know, what, what, what are the changes in global gene expression? And so what we did is that we did a combined RNA-seq approach. And the whole goal was to identify how the interaction takes place between the host sugar beet, Rhizoctonia solanae, and leuconostoc mesenteroides. So we had done for all three time points, one day, two day, and three day post inoculation. But I'm just showing you some examples about the trend of the gene expression. And you can clearly see that the carbon and nitrogen metabolism related genes are highly upregulated in terms of the pathway enrichment besides the plant hormone signal tra transaction. So here I'm presenting a few examples of differentially expressed genes. You know, the list is super big, but I'm just focusing on a few things. And what we can clearly see the very first and the top candidate that is showing up in our RNA-seq analysis is the 
polygalactyrinase inhibitor. And this is exactly what we had seen high expression of the Rajotunia solanae polygalactyrinase gene. So it clearly tells us that polygalactyrinase originating from R. solanae is one of the major targets. And that's why the plant is actually producing a polygalactyrinase inhibitor protein to combat the situation. And this chart also shows you actually uh, how the plant responds to a fungal pathogen versus a bacterial pathogen. So as an example, you can clearly see here that peroxidase 27, you know, and all of these oxygen binding proteins, you can clearly see that it is highly upregulated when the plant is experiencing Rajoctonia solanae, not much with leuconostoc, basically it's a little lower. So there is a differential response from the plant's plant perspective where the plant responds depending upon the nature of the pathogen, whether it's a fungal pathogen or whether it's a bacterial pathogen. Similarly, we also looked at the global gene expression in R. solanae at all different time points, but I'm just giving here an example at one day post inoculation. And as expected that ribosome related uh, genes were highly upregulated because at the early stages of infection, the pathogen is multiplying. So it is quite expected that ribosome will go up and uh, besides ribosome, carbon metabolism also plays a major role at early infection stage, stages. And we can see a lot of genes are being represented from citrate cycle and glyoxylate and dicarboxylate metabolism related uh, pathways. A closer look at the differentially expressed genes uh, is presented here in this table. Means we have a long list, but I'm just showing you some example. And the one that is boxed here at the very top shows ADP and ATP carrier protein. This is a very interesting and exciting candidate. So when it first showed up uh, in our data, I was wondering that, you know, what, what is this candidate? What is known about this gene in other pathogens? So what we found is that, so, this, so a little background about this gene. So what this gene or this protein does is it actually recycles ATP from mitochondria to cytoplasm. And uh, during the early infection stages, the energy, it's, uh, it's highly dependent upon the source of energy. And th th there are a few papers, and one of the papers, it shows that in botrytis, when you actually mutate this gene, it loses pathogenicity. So this actually gives us a very clear idea what could be potential targets in, in the future, you know, if we have to take the RNAi-based route. And besides this uh, gene, a bunch of other genes, you know, associated with ribosomal protein, which is quite expected, and uh, elongation factor. So th th this gives us some idea about what we could target in the future. Similarly, we also looked at the leuconostoc uh, genes, you know, and there's a distinct difference between prokaryotic versus uh, eukaryotic pathogens. And you can clearly see that in leuconostoc mesenteroides, the pathway enrichment was for ribosome biosynthetic pathways and seleno compound metabolism. So ribosome is quite expected because at that early stages, the bacteria is just multiplying. The, ma making more copies is the most important thing at the time. And that makes sense that ribosome related genes are showing up there. But another interesting aspect which I find is seleno compound metabolism. So I was doing some literature search to see that what, what, what is this all about and why these are important. So selenium is a micronutrient which is present in all in both host and pathogens. But what happens is that selenium is very important for bacterial pathogenesis. And what selenium does is that selenium gets incorporated into cysteine. And selenocysteine, there, there, there's tons of literature out there in bacterial pathogenesis and the role of uh, seleno compound and or selenocysteines and how they affect uh, bacterial pathogenesis both in mammalian system as well as in plants. So that's quite interesting. And that shows that the difference between fungal and bacterial pathogenesis and what pathways are turned on. A closer look at the candidate genes that were differentially expressed. So we had the same way we had like one DPI, two DPI and three DPI. I'm just showing you a few examples of how the candidate genes look like in uh, leuconostoc mesenteroides. And the first candidate ATP synthase and translation initiation factor IF1, a uh, lot of 
things out also in the literature where people have targeted uh, this gene specific specifically in bacteria to um, inhibit bacterial pathogenesis. So this gives a clear idea that what we can target in the future through potentially RNAi based approach. Then as we see a lot of gene expression related scenes, uh, changes in carbohydrate related metabolism, we were also interested to see that what, what are the cell wall degraded products you know, showing up in our material. So as you can clearly see that uh, these are the four different kinds of sugars that we have detected in our samples. Sucrose goes down with infection and you have the most reduction where you have both rhizotonia and stocks together. That makes sense because sucrose is the stored carbohydrate in the vacuoles of the cells in sugar beet. And as you have more pathogenesis, there is a high demand of carbon and that's why the sucrose goes down. But interestingly, glucose plus gal galactose and fructose, they go up. Why? Because these are the degradation products of the complex cell wall sugars and thereby contributing to the production of more simpler sugars. And that's why we see increase in uh, simple cell wall sugars, which actually corroborates well with what we had seen with increased expression of the plant cell wall degrading uh, genes. Next, we were also interested in looking at the total carbon and nitrogen because what we see in our entire data set that carbon and nitrogen metabolism related genes are differentially expressed. So we do not see much change in carbon, which is expected because carbon is not a thing that changes th th that much. So, but you know, we see some changes, which is significant in terms of stock infection, but nitrogen increases significantly. And the next question comes that, how could the nitrogen in sugar beet root increase? You know, what, what, what is the cause, you know? So as we, we saw in our previous slides that nitrogen metabolism related genes are highly upregulated in the, in the sugar beet host. So the thing is that during pathogenesis, there is a high demand for nitrogen. So the host requires nitrogen for host defense. Pathogens, they require nitrogen for pathogenesis. And so basically what it tells us that there is an in uptake of nitrogen by the roots. And that's why we see nitrogen metabolism related genes are highly upregulated in the sugar beet um, roots. And what we clearly see here that the ratio of the carbon and nitrogen is significantly decreased. So what it tells us here is that there is a shift in nitrogen-based primary metabolism than carbon-based. And more the infection you have, more the ratio goes down. And C by N ratio is very critical in plants because it controls a big subset of genes depending on, upon this ratio. So the major conclusions that we can come from this study is uh, we have identified the key candidate genes belonging to pectin lyes and polygalactyurinase from Rhizoctonia solanae. And these are the candidates that actually contribute to increased root rod when R solanae is closely associated with uh, liconostoc mesenteroides in, in the soil and when they infect the sugar beet roots. And pathway enrichment an an analysis show different pathogenesis strategies employed by eukaryotic versus prokaryote, where we can see selenocompound metabolism showing up here and then here you carry out, depending upon the nature of the pathogen, whether it's sugar beet or uh, Rhizoctonia solanae, you see that uh, carbon nitrogen metabolism related genes are turned on more. And then increase in cell wall degraded sugars by exogenous plant cell wall degrading enzymes and total nitrogen corroborate well with uh, root rot symptoms and nitrogen metabolism related gene expression during pathogenesis. And then every research should lead us to another re research and the candidate genes that we have identified in our case, especially the polygalactyurinase and ADP, ATP carrier protein from Rhizoctonia solanae or ATP synthase genes that we have identified from Leuconostoc mesenteroides. We can actually take this through a future RNAi based approach, which is uh, the Higgs host induced gene silencing. And uh, we are actually developing some co constructs to, to target these genes uh, to stable transformation of sugar beets. And this could be a potential and alternative strategy for future disease control besides what we currently have. And I greatly acknowledge our research leader, Dave, and 
my excellent um, technician page and the entire team other technicians josh joyce uh, incredible team without incredible team you cannot have a great research so i'm very thankful to all of them thank you for your attention